I want to speak on a topic that came to my mind a little earlier today, and that is being slain in the spirit. Being slain in the spirit. Is being slain in the spirit biblical? Is it a godly doctrine? You know, when you go to church and people become overwhelmed in the spirit and they fall out to the point where people have to build a circle around them, put sheets around them to keep from them harming themselves or to prevent the clothing of women to expose their nakedness. So to keep women dressed from coming up, they put sheets around them and they keep them from harming themselves. I used to sit back in church and just observe. And I always questioned in my mind, after all of the shouting and the crying and the falling out, what was the end result? What did they get from all of that? What changes took place in their life? I've been in services where people were screaming to the top of their lungs. They were falling out completely out of control. And it always went against the scriptures. But yet, many preachers or many churches teach that it's the Holy Spirit. That these people are slain in the Spirit. But is being slain in the Spirit biblical? We're going to deal with that today. But first I want to remind you of the fruit of the Spirit, taking from the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, where the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control being able to control yourself. So if you had self-control, there is no need for anyone to have to hold you to keep you from harming yourself or to keep young women from exposing themselves. I've always said it's a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's a ghost, but it's not the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost would not allow you to harm yourself. The Holy Ghost operates in love and in joy. In many cases, these people are screaming out as if they are demonically possessed. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Long-suffering, being able to suffer long. You're kind. But in the church, so many are as mean as a junkyard dog. Faithfulness, gentleness, and we often talk about these masculine women, these women that are aggressive and violent, especially those in the church that fight in the church, but yet they say they are saved. 
But I want to deal with the scripture when it gives an example of people being quote unquote slain in the spirit. And I want to show you that it's not what people think it is. Being slain in the spirit is not what we see in churches today. Because the end result is they laid out on the floor. They're quote unquote slain in the spirit, but yet God is not speaking to them. There's no deliverance. There's no healing. There's no real testimony that people can see for themselves. We know what we see and we testify what we do see. Or better yet, we speak what we know and we testify what we do see. It's one thing to be quote unquote, slain in the spirit and say that God delivered you, but yet we don't know what happens when you're behind those four walls at home. We are not with you when you have to go to bed at night and if you go to bed alone but it's not our business. But you make it our business by saying that you were slain in the spirit and God delivered you. But I want to show you in the book of Revelation where John the Baptist or John the Revelator was slain in the spirit, but yet him being slain in the spirit was the result of Christ presenting himself to him. He was overwhelmed with supernatural presence. The first chapter of the book of Revelation, the 17th verse reads as follows. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. I want to take you to the book of Ezekiel. The first chapter reading the 28th verse. And it reads as follow. Like the appearance of the bow, meaning the rainbow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. This is what Ezekiel is seeing. He's in the spirit. So he's got a testimony because I am now reading his testimony from the Torah. It goes on to say, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Now keep in mind, this is not the voice of a preacher speaking. This is not a mediator. No one is between them. They're dealing with the source of power. They are dealing with pure energy. This is Ezekiel. I want to take you to the book of Daniels, the eighth chapter, reading the 17th and the 18th verse. And it reads as follows. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand 
O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. There's always a reason why the prophets of the Most High fall on their face. It's not just because they are overcome with emotions. It's not because of the fact that the choir sung well or that the preacher or the evangelist preached them outside of themselves. Man had nothing to do with these prophets being slain. It says, I was frightened and I fell on my face, but he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So he didn't only just fall on his face because he was overwhelmed with emotions, but because of the fact that he was dealing with pure energy and the Most High was revealing the vision of the end time to him. The 18th verse says, and when he had spoken to me, now who is this he? He's not dealing with an evangelist. He's not dealing with a preacher. He's dealing with pure energy, the source of all beings. It says, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He was in the presence of pure energy, the presence of God. And when he lost strength because of the greatness of God's presence, God spoke to him and touched him and made him stand on his feet gave him enough strength to stand on his feet. He had self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I want to read another scripture. What I, I love this scripture, and um, this scripture has so much in it that oftentimes we tend to not really see the jewels within the scriptures because we get so carried away with emotions and Christianity and, and false doctrines that we really can't see the essence of what the word is saying to us. I want to read the book of Matthews, the 17th chapter, starting the first verse, and I'll read down to the eighth verse, and it reads as follow. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, Yeshua is about to show them something great. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus cast out devils. They seen him feed the hungry. Uh, they seen him heal the sick. The same man that said that he was the son of God or the son of man is now about to see him in his true form, his true essence. It says, the second verse says, and he was transfigured before them. So he took these three men up into a high mountain alone. And when they got into the mountain, Jesus transfigured before them. He changed right before their presence. And the Bible says, and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. 
And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So not only did Yeshua transform and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light, but you had two dead prophets that appeared right before their very eyes. They're actually witnessing these things. So you don't have an evangelist preaching you outside of yourself to the point where he touched you or blow on you and you fall out for no reason. And then when you come to yourself, you have no idea what happened to you. You have no testimony. The only thing you're left with is a good, a, a, a feel good feeling or a good feeling. But it says, behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, two dead men, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. Peter wanted to make churches like you find people doing today and naming churches after Peter and Paul and Jesus. Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here or three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Not only did two dead men, two dead prophets appear after Jesus transformed. But now we have it where a cloud, a bright cloud is overshadowing them. And then an audible voice comes from the cloud and validates Yeshua. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And then it says, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. They had every reason to lose strength because they were in the presence of pure spiritual energy. You can't get no purer than that. And they fell on their face and they were terrified but Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. He gave them strength. No one had to wrap clothes around them or wrap them in sheets or hold them to keep them from harming themselves. They were in complete and total control and they had a testimony. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So after all of this greatness they saw, this greatness that was revealed to them, the supernatural, where there was no one in the middle, no middleman, no preacher, no evangelist, no man to preach them happy. Or the choir singing to the point where they lose themselves and fall out. And someone has to wrap sheets around them to keep them from harming themselves. None of that happened. But the awesome greatness of God's presence was before them to make them lose strength to fall out. 
So much of what we see today in churches is not of God. You have to be careful because, and I always say this, because much of what you see that you think is the power of the Holy Ghost is no more than witchcraft and voodoo. I shared a story before where I was talking to this preacher and he had no idea who I was. I was with a friend of mine which happened to be a Muslim and he must have thought that I was a Muslim as well. And he was telling us about how he go to Haiti so many times out of the year. And he gets stuff to sprinkle around his church to try to get more members. And he's got the type of ministry that I'm talking about where the preacher blow on someone and they fall out. Or the preacher touched them and they fall out. Or you have these churches where the people have a laughing spirit where they can't stop laughing. A demon. But yet they call that the power of God. Which God are they referring to? Because that is not the spirit of Yahweh. So you have to be mindful of these churches where you see people are slain in the spirit. I always used to question. What were they feeling? Were they in control of themselves when they fell out? What were they experiencing when they were out? Were, was God communicating with them? Were they, were they receiving a healing or a blessing? And why you never hear these people testify? They fall out sick and they wake up sick. And then the preacher tell them, just go and have faith. I want to read another scripture. And this scripture really don't fit the topic, but it does. Because a lot of what we see in church today is all show, performance. It's hoodoo and voodoo magic. Making people think that the preacher or the evangelist is powerful in operating with the spirit of Yah when in reality it's no more than witchcraft. Because Jesus was smooth. He didn't have to do all of the hookah mashanda and the screaming and the coffin and the and, and as if he was trying to trying to breathe and and everything he says it's got to be a so pay attention to what or how Jesus handled himself when he cast out these demons listen to what he said he didn't have to use scripted techniques to cast out demons. You know how you go to some churches and you hear, uh, I, 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 I charge you uh, by the anointing of God that come out of this person. I bind you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they got so many words. And the Bible said that they pray thinking that they would be heard for their much words. But Jesus didn't speak too many words. And I'm going to show you in this final scripture. That's taken from the book of Matthew, the 8th chapter, reading in the 28th to the 34th verse. And it reads as follows. And when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, two people, two men possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. In other words, they were coming out of the graveyard. These people hung out in the graveyard. They hung around dead things. 
So they were coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce. They were out of control, angry. The Bible says so that no man might pass by that way. The 29th verse says, and behold, they cried out saying, these are these two demons that's possessing these men or better yet, these demons that's possessing these two men were crying out. They were using the lips, the vocal cords of these two men to cry out. So it wasn't the men that was crying out. It was the demons that were possessing them because the demons knew exactly who Yeshua was. Because when they saw him, the first thing they said was, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? The 30th verse says, and there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him saying, if thou cast us out, suffer. In other words, allow us to go away into the herd of swine. The 32nd verse says, and he said unto them, go. That's all he said. He didn't use no rituals. He wasn't pretending to be uh, what they call exorcist. He just said, go. He didn't yell. I'm sure he didn't yell because I don't see an exclamation mark. I see a period. But it says, and he said unto them, go. And it says, and when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently. Look at the effects that these spirits had on these pigs, but yet these were the same spirits that was possessing these two men. They ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them Fled. In other words, those that were tending to the herd of swine saw what happened and they ran and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen of the possessed with devils. The 34th verse says, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. There are people that don't want you delivered. They don't want those that are bound and possessed with demons to be delivered. They want you to be demonically possessed because the minute they saw these men that were in their right mind and they were clothed. You would think that they would celebrate and be happy for them. But instead, the Bible says, when they saw him, they besought him, meaning Yeshua, that he would depart out of their coast. In other words, they kicked him out because he came and was delivering folk. These two men that were hanging in the tombs that were violent to the point where people were afraid to pass by. They couldn't tame them. So they were left out there alone to fend for themselves. Being possessed and oppressed by demonic spirits. But because Jesus cast them out, because he gave them leave or permission to go into the pigs and these men were delivered, the whole city came out 
to meet Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, they begged him that he would depart out of their coast. Leave, get out. We don't want you here. The same thing happened politically recently when we had Trump that was trying to do for America, taxpayers, and the people did the same thing. And I'm not liking uh, Trump to Yeshua. I'm just saying we're living in times where people love wickedness and evil more than they love the truth. More than they love goodness and mirth mercy and faith and kindness. If this was a video where I'm going to someone's mother's graveyard to urinate on it or I'm cursing somebody out, oh, I would have a lot of people sharing this video. There would be a lot of people subscribing. But instead, I'm speaking truth to power and people don't want to hear it. They're like these people that came out to meet Jesus and when they saw him and saw what he did, they begged him to depart out of their coast, to get out of their city. Because I'm sure Jesus was messing with somebody's pockets, just like we have with the Democrats. They don't want people to be well. They want you to be dependent upon them. So they're going to make good seem evil. And they're going to make the evil that they do seem good. And if you don't have Christ in your life, if you don't have the discernment of the spirit of Yah, you will be deceived. And that's why we have so many people deceived in churches today. And I'll say boldly that not too many preachers have that kind of power where people would be delivered. Oh, trust me. There are churches that do have the power of Yah. But they don't know what to do with that power. They don't know how to use that power. And I gave reference in my last video about when the disciples could not cast out a devil, they asked Jesus, well, well, why couldn't we do it? He said, because of your unbelief. See, you have power, but you really don't believe God could do those things through you. You don't believe that you are worthy because no one knows you but you. So you don't believe that you are worthy to be used by God. So God gave you a gift. And you may make a few noise, a hook of mashandas and skidiosis, and you may fall out and claim to be slain in the spirit when in reality you're not. You're just overcome with emotions or. That could just be the results of that pastor or evangelist dabbling into the strange fire. Speaking of fire, I remember I was in my early 20s and I was visiting this Church of God in Christ because I love going to revivals. You know, I sit back and observe and, and um, I question a lot of things that I see. Not that I don't believe it, I understand it, but when I see um, people shouting, people slain in the spirit, the evangelist is touching people and they're falling out, I always question like, okay, I wonder how that person's life ended up after all of that power. I mean, you could be in an environment where you can, it's so thick in there. The anointing is so thick that you can cut it with a knife. But yet, no one is being 
delivered. No one is being healed. No one has a real testimony. They may stand up and test a lie or say, God delivered me from smoking. And then when they get home, they're lighting up a spliff because now no one can see them. But when they come out or when they get on YouTube or before the camera, they're holy and they're righteous and they pretend to have all of this power and they yell to show that they have power. They have to constantly glory to God. You know the preacher voice. But Jesus, when the spirits begged him to go into the pigs, Yeshua didn't have to do any of that. He just said, go. And there was results. So what did he do that these preachers are not doing? What does he know that these evangelists that claim to be anointed, what does he know that they don't know? Because I'm sure they feel they're operating with the same spirit, but yet they don't have the power to deliver, to cast out demons, to heal people from sickness, or even feed 5,000. So what is it that Jesus have where all he have to say is go? And he gets results, but yet the preachers and the evangelists would touch the person or blow on them and they fall out as dead men. But there's no lights. Yeshua's not talking to them. They're not receiving a revelation. They're not being healed or delivered. We hear demons screaming, but yet the preachers can't identify the demons because he don't have that discernment. So he think the screaming that he hear is the power of the Holy Ghost when in reality is demons screaming to come out because the anointing is so powerful. But yet they don't have the knowledge to use the power that the Most High gives them. So churches were closed during this pandemic. Shouldn't the church should have been the place where people go that was sick with all manners of diseases and infections and viruses. And all the preacher had to do was lay hands on them or speak the word. And because he had the faith, they would be delivered. So now, we're living in times where people find it difficult to believe in God. They say they believe in God, but they know in their hearts of heart that they have doubt. And they are afraid to deal with the doubt that's in their heart because they don't want to appear to be a non-believer. They feel it protects them from the hellfire. When in reality, it's only sending you to the hellfire because you error by not knowing the scriptures nor the power thereof. But I'm gonna end the script, I'm gonna end this video right now. So what do you think about being slain in the spirit? And have you been slain in the spirit? And what was the end result of you being slain in the spirit? 
if you tell me that you were healed, well, do you have a doctor's note where the doctor would confirm that you had an illness and now you're miraculously healed? Or do you just expect us to take your word? Because when these men was delivered from these demons, after Yeshua just said go, well, the people of the city went and talked about it. Even when he said, don't say nothing, don't tell nobody, they couldn't keep it to themselves. But the church claimed to have all of this power that they keep to themselves behind the four walls. So you being slain in the spirit is no more than you being overcome with emotion. You're deceiving yourself or someone put a serious case of witchcraft on your mind because there's no reason why any man should touch you and you fall out without there being any type of results. So being slain in the spirit is in the Bible. I just read the scriptures. But there was always a reason why these men fell on their face as a dead man. And they just didn't stay there. Yeshua or the Most High gave them enough strength to stand up on their feet. See, the Most High don't like to deal with coward soldiers. He don't want to deal with you on your face. He wants you to stand up like a man and talk to him. So whenever John the Revelator fell out, and this scripture throughout uh, the book of Revelation where he kept falling out, he was before pure energy. And every time he fell, the spirit entered into him and lifted him on his feet. The Most High wants you on your feet. He don't want you on your face. He wants you to stand up. And talk to him like a man. Or like a woman. So. Is slain in the spirit. Is it biblical? Were you slain in the spirit? And what was the result of you. Falling out on the floor. Being wrapped up in sheets. So that you didn't injure yourself. Or as a woman. You wouldn't, you, to keep you from exposing your body. That's not the Holy Ghost. Because like I read to you, one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So feedback, tell me what you think, subscribe, click on the cash app or the chime or the Venmo and support this channel, leave an offering. Until next time, I'm fearless.